while 29 years ago I was 37. <laughs> October 7, 1990, I started this church, and I was afraid. I never preached much. I was really afraid. And um, there were three people that believed in me. Pastor Alan Yulstead, who was the superintendent, asked me actually to stay here and not go to Kansas City. And Pastor Wheats, who I worked with, who found the building we started in over here and urged me and had to basically kick me down the road to go look at it. I was pretty afraid. And, uh, but his heart was to plant churches. And then Charles Crabtree, who told me that when he was here, he had bought property in Urbandale and always had a vision for Urbandale. And he believed in me. He urged me. He said, you can do it. Do it. And so I just want to acknowledge that and just say um, a thank you to those guys, uh, one in heaven, and but Georgine, you're here, so I'll give you credit for that, and thank you. Um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, to those of you that were here, uh, maybe you're part of the core, you showed up that first Sunday, and not if you showed up one Sunday and you never came back, but like you're a part of putting this, planting this thing down. Would you stand up if you were here and you were a part of planting the church? Stand up. There's my daughter, Pastor Carrie and Lori. I was Pastor Carrie's youth pastor. I had hair. <laughs> Ray and Nevy showed up first Sunday, and Beth, Beth uh, Blix, and then Larry came. Yep. And Michelle and her whole family, Linda, and her, her sisters, uh, Harley and Joe in early service, so a few in the early service. So, oh, and Con and Laura Gillens. Con was our sound guy, and Con's one of our first deacons. Uh, and my wife Susan, she came with me, believe it or not. So <laughs> she now occasionally attends when I'm not preaching. <laughs> but she came today since it's the 29th anniversary. Actually, uh, I'm not her favorite preacher, uh, but I am her favorite husband. Uh, <laughs> but that's only said to the fact that she hasn't tried another. So <laughs> if if I kick the bucket, I'll probably be number two if she finds the right guy. <laughs> But um, our church uh, established in my heart, I, I prayed, I fasted and prayed for, for, for four days, and the Lord laid it on my heart that those that are the most needy are where you put the most emphasis, and he showed me who, who's the most dependent as babies. And we put our investment in, in uh, to children's pastors, two of them, before we hired anybody else, and they were phenomenal. And, and they're a big part of why this church is what it is today. And um, Carrie and Lori, I was Carrie's youth pastor, and he came over and helped me and preached, and he's a part of the plant. He had been doing evangelism, and, and he made a commitment for a year, and I think they were here a year and a half, along with uh, your sister and her husband, and, and um, helped us get it going. Um, and I appreciate all these people. Uh, uh, before that, I'd known Carrie. I actually put them together because I thought Lori was a good catch for him because the way he looks, I didn't think he could ever catch anybody like Lori. So I gave, I gave a sales pitch to Lori and she said, okay, I guess somebody's got to marry him. But anyway, <laughs> Carrie, Carrie was a nut in my youth group. He was a straight A student. Um, he, is an, he is an incredible man with an incredible brain. Uh, he has written for the Billy Graham organization uh, uh, the, the uh, people that do uh, uh, martyrs, uh, the martyrs ministry, um, uh, yeah, Voice of Martyrs, and many other uh, national ministries. He wrote the Fire Bible, the notes in the Youth Fire Bible that is made available through the Assemblies of God. He rewrote the youth curriculum, and uh, we hired a genius discipleship uh, pastor here with Kerry, and I always knew he was smart and very devoted, and I was there when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, um, and I saw it, and, uh, and uh, about 25 other young people uh, back when I was in Sheldon, Iowa, and I had hair, and I was young, and back then, I was really, really handsome, and, uh, and then life happened, and I, my thought, face got caught on fire, and somebody put it out with a hatchet, so now you know what happened there. But... Uh, we have we established some things that, that are values, and one was to be a church that was Christian or education oriented in Sunday school and systematic, grade by grade, teaching the Bible. 
Our world today is biblically illiterate. People in the churches are biblically illiterate. Number two was to win souls. For every Sunday, we had first-time conversion for more than eight years. Every Sunday this morning, we had two people respond to Jesus Christ for the first time, give their life to Christ in the 8 o'clock. And, and if you're here and you don't have the peace that you know if you were to die, you go to heaven, then Jesus is here. What we want to give you is Jesus. He'll forgive you and fill your heart and change your heart. Instead of desiring sinful ways, he'll change your heart to, to have a heart for him, to please him, to serve him. Another one was missions, to not only evangelize here and win souls, but send people and give to people and reach the whole world through missions to be a missions church. And I remember going to Ethiopia with Sam Johnson and my heart being changed. And one of the things that God has given me for going forward is that instead of one or two mission trips a year, we need six or eight mission trips a year. We need everybody that can possibly go to get on a field and see what it's like because it'll change your perspective and change your heart forever. And you'll, by nature, pray for missions and you'll give the missions. And I'm, my heart is that over the next 10 years, at least 25 people from this church will be called to missions, get ready, go, and are actively serving somewhere in a mission field. We have several others that I already have. And, um, and I want us to win people. We've only scratched the surface. There's so many lost people in a dying culture where most denominations and other churches have gone the way of what I call universal salvation because Jesus died. He loves everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. God forgives that. You can live however you want. You can live out of wedlock. You can do whatever you want to do. And you're still going to go to heaven because Jesus died. And that's not what the Bible says. In fact, salvation isn't a formula or a truth that by you just go and apply grace that says God did it all. I do nothing. That's not what it is. Grace is power that changes your heart. The, 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 the last times Paul wrote to Timothy that perilous times will come and it says there that they'll have a form of religion denying the power of God. The power of God is to change a heart. That's what it changes a heart. That's what Christ does when he saves you. He saves you from a sinful heart. He saves you from the desire to live for yourself. And I want to see people changed. And you can be a part of it. And we have a few things that we believe that will access and help you and equip you and give you ideas where you can come together and win people. And uh, there's a few things that are going on. Pastor Kerry, I've asked him to come as a part of my message, and, and it's not just a one-minute thing. He's going to share here a little bit and tell you about the cards and stuff. So, Pastor Kerry, if you come, and how you can get involved in winning the lost, okay? How you can get involved in winning the lost. We all need to be involved. All right, man, this is a good day, and I'm excited about what I'm going to be talking to here for a, a few minutes. Uh, day didn't start out so good for me. I'm getting dressed, and I... I uh, uh, get dressed and it, we have a large closet and I turn the light on there. I can do, do my thing in there. But I didn't want to have to go back and forth and disturb my wife. So um, I put a lot of my own stuff in there. And I took one of my cologne bottles and I put it there in there. So I have it in there. And I, I don't, uh, you know, put it on. So I just kind of spray it in the air and kind of uh, waft into it a little bit. You know, so it kind of settles over me. This is the second time I've done this. But my wife's, most of her perfumes are there. And I just by inadvertently grabbed uh, one of her perfumes. I didn't notice until I had it all over me. And I thought, man, that was my wife's perfume. So instead of just going with it and thinking, okay, I thought, well, I better spray some of mine on there. Maybe at least some of that. Color. So I've got like two things going on here. And then this morning I was kind of scurrying around with some stuff. And I got a little sweat mixed into it. So uh, now my wife, I think, wore, wore what I put on this morning initially. So if we're together, it's all right. Uh, but if I'm walking by myself and they go by and it smells a little funky, uh, you know that, uh, that that's what's, what's happening. Now, I don't want, when I go by, I don't want to see you like sticking your nose and trying to get a whiff because that's just weird, okay? And you're going to give me a complex beside it if, if that happens. So uh, please don't do that to me. So anyway, uh, I want to talk about something for just a few moments. Uh, Pastor is going to talk this morning about where we're going from here. 
after 29 years, where does the Lord want to take us so we can continue to fulfill our mission, not only to make it to heaven, but to take as many people as we can uh, with us. And we've devised a, a strategy for outreach so we can be more effective than we've ever been before, not all just all over the world, but even in our own community. And last quarter in, in, the, in the magazine, I hope you had time to read it, uh, is a little uh, excerpt on that, something we're going to be calling The Mission. And it's going to involve a lot of facets from an evangelistic prayer strategy to special events, the way we do promotion, community outreach, all kinds of things are, are going to be going on. But one of the key components of this whole thing, and something we believe that almost everybody can take part in something, uh, is uh, what we're calling shared interest groups. Because when pastor talks about outreach, what anybody does, we, we all want to do more of that. We all want to invite people. We all want to make an influence. We all want to reach out. But how do we exactly do that? One of the first things that you need to do is establish common ground with somebody. Well, shared interest groups are built in common ground. They're going to be an occasion for you to come together with people to do something you already do, something you know and love, and in the course of that, to meet new friends here at church who are into the same thing. But at the same time, when these groups start to form, there's going to be at least some of you who are doing your thing together who know others that you've been doing that same thing with who would love to meet other people who are into that. And so all of a sudden, you may have four or five people together kind of doing their thing regularly, and you meet to two or three other friends or invite your other friends you know in on that, and they meet several others from the church, and all of a sudden, they've got a connection here before they've ever set foot in this place. And I guarantee you start building your relationships both in and out uh, with people like that. It's not going to be long where some of them come to find out what's going on here. And that's the idea behind shared interest groups. And one of the beauty of shared interest groups is it isn't something you're going to need to carve out extra time necessarily on your schedule. Because we're talking things that you already do. Things you're already into and just making those things available to God to say, God, here's something I would have never thought or maybe you can't even think now how that would relate to spiritual things or church. And you're going to say, I'm going to take that and offer it to you and that's going to become an occasion where I can make some relationships that will eventually influence others for Christ. Now, this isn't going to be the, the deep, we're not looking to take people deep into everything. We offer groups in Christian education and prayer groups and other type of ministry groups this is not going to be there. This is going to be more of a frontline evangelistic type of ministry. Uh, the church really has four purposes. The Assemblies of God and our mission statement has this. A lot of other church organizations over time have kind of come to the conclusion there's four main purposes of the church. Uh, one is worship. Where we come here, what we're doing in here and other contexts like this. Uh, one is fellowship. People getting together, building relationships, uh, sharpening each other, just knowing we're in this together. Uh, one is discipleship, all the ministries that take people deeper in the word, and then evangelism and outreach. Shared interest groups, even though they're not, we're not looking to, to necessarily take it, people deep into studying everything, are going to fulfill two of those purposes very well. Bringing people together in fellowship and bringing an occasion to reach out to people who are into the same things that we love, who we can begin to connect them to Christ. Let me just give you a couple examples of the potential that can happen when people come together like this. Uh, I was talking in my Sunday school class, kind of introducing this concept, and somebody brought up the thing, hey, uh, we could have a group of motorcycle riders. And I thought, I've already talked to a couple people about that, and I'm sure that's going to happen. And later on at the hospital, talking with the same person, we got into further conversation. And he was sharing me that one of our, his brother-in-law, Jesse Helmick, usually sits here in first service. He rides, and they were off one time riding with several of them together. And they came across another, and motorcycle guys, they tend to do this. You pass one, he's kind of alone, and hey, can I ride with you? And so he joined them. They pulled out off shortly thereafter to have something to eat. They struck up conversation, build a relationship. But long story short, he's telling me about who this guy is. And he's some big wig in town here, is a businessman, runs a, runs a, a big operation. I said, man, that sounds an awful lot about my, the, like uh, my, uh, my wife, her assistant uh, accountant there. That sounds like her partner. Sure enough, it was. I know the guy, and I know he and Jesse would have never probably connected in any other context, come from two different worlds, two different perspectives, but they had that commonality of riding, and now they get together, they've ridden together since, they share fellowship, uh, and he's trying to influence him for Christ. Another guy the other day came into my office, was talking about groups, 
and uh, uh, he mentioned to me, he said, uh, is there going to be a, a, you know, bicycle riders? I said, yeah, I've already talked to a couple people, they're probably going to be doing that. And the conversation went on to other things, we got to talking about other ministries, and Talk about men's ministry. I said, I'd like to get a lot of mentorship relationships going with men. And he said, man, there's a guy in the church I've had some connection with. I'd really like to spend time with him and, and, and be mentored by him. I think I could learn an awful lot. And I knew the guy. He's in everything. He's very busy. I thought, man, he probably wouldn't hardly have time for that. But then it dawned on me. He's one of the guys who mentioned that he, he rides uh, cycles. And I thought, what if these guys got together in a cycling group and that mentorship just happened organically through that? That's discipleship. All of a sudden, these groups are fulfilling all kinds uh, of things. Now, a shared interest group can be any number of things. You've got a, on this little sheet here. Now, um, I need a, if you don't have access to one of these, they're in the pews. Some of them are laying there. If you don't uh, have one of these, I want you to raise your hand. Uh, ushers, if somebody can help me in the back, a few people, and keep your hands up and make sure you get one of these in your hands because I want you to be able to have it. Pastor's going to be, uh, at the end of the service, this is going to be part of our response. You're going to be able to lay these on the table today and say, hey, I'm going to make myself available to God through this thing I'm already into and see what God can do with it. But anyway, you'll see on there just some ideas. On the first side of it says, what's your thing? And it mentions anything, you know, hiking and biking, baking, building, read, run, craft, uh, working on cars, creating clothes, taking pictures, watching football, anything. That can be a group, but groups can also be based on an interest. Maybe you've got something for a period of time you want to know more about uh, your family situation. We had somebody mention they want to have a group of parents of boys for a period of time, or maybe uh, empty nesters, or, or parents of college students, or whatever. Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities. The, the, the possibilities are infinite with these type of groups. Uh, of what they can become. I already this morning talked to several people. Hey, do you think this could be a group? Anything could be a group. And we're not talking just getting together and having fun for Jesus. We're talking being intentional about building relationships in here and a forum where we can invite people from outside to be part of what we're doing and eventually lead them to Christ. Conversations come up in those organic uh, times that will lead uh, to deeper things and eventually you can begin to talk about the things of God. We're encouraging when you come together with groups, the one thing we want to keep as a central component, again, we're not looking to go deep in this, but when you get together, take time to, to find out what's going on in each other's lives, and take a brief time to pray every time you get together. I can tell you whether it's a believer or an unbeliever, few people will turn down prayer. That alone, that you're starting to go to God and bring people's needs, will, will perk people up in a lot of ways. And God, I believe, will begin to answer prayers for people who don't even know him because they'll have no other explanation than the fact that, hey, these guys have been praying for me and something's happened. I guarantee that'll draw them to what's going on in this place. So that's a potential for a shared interest group. Now, on the back of this form is a place to submit your ideas, and we're looking for ideas of all sorts. The first lines there are for people who are already maybe doing something with people and never thought this could be a group, but we want to know about it. Because we're going to put it out there, we're going to make it available to other people, and we're going to spread the word. But if you've got an idea said, well, I do this, and I'd like to do it with more people, I've got a few maybe I'm already doing it with, the blanks right in the middle of this page by this group uh, idea circle is where you can put down your ideas. And nothing is off limits. Uh, you'd like to sit around the fire pit on Friday night. There's probably other people who'd like to do that. We're going to put that out there, and probably some people will join you, tailgating at football games, just all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's where those ideas go. Now, we're going to need some point people to kind of help coordinate this. And if you're willing to be a point person, you're not going to have to run the group, but you're just one that when we start getting other people who are interested in that idea, we can, we can put them to you and hook them up. Because what's going to happen after we collect these for a, a few weeks? We want to get as many of them as we can today, but we're going to make this available for the next few weeks. And then we're going to put out in the foyer a table just with all of these ideas all across it. You'll be able to come just out of curiosity and look what's up. And people can start signing up to say, this is what I want to be a part of. And then we're going to start putting people together and letting these things develop. There'll be ways we kind of equip you to do some things through this. But we believe this is going to be a way where we're going to start to reach out in, in things we just are already loving. And God is going to take what he's put within you. I tell you, you take something God's put within you and you start to make it available to him, that becomes an act of worship. And so we're going to let God take the passions he's built within us and start to put them in effect for his purposes. And don't limit God. 
Whatever idea might come to your mind, say, man, maybe there's a way he can use that to reach more people for him. And at the end of the service, you're going to get a chance to turn some of these in. If you can't make it down here, there'll be a box out in the information center. You can put them in there at any time or give them to a pastor. And we believe God is going to use uh, this ministry of shared interest groups like maybe nothing else we do to, to reach a lot of people for his glory. So I, I was quite aware that he was, thank you, yes, give, give Carrie encouragement. I'm very, very, very aware that he was taking some significant time because the message I'm preaching, this is a practical response, okay? So before long, when, once you become a Christian, you get in the church, before long you develop believer friends because you have this common thing of, of, of Christ's family. And before long, the only people you know are people that are already uh, with Jesus. They're already followers of Jesus. You don't, you don't really, you're not really real close. You don't hang out with people that aren't. And, and that's not what God wants us to do, okay? And so I'm, I'm going to start. I, I love people, and I love to visit, and I love breakfast. So I'm going to start four guys from the church, uh, me and three more, and then each of us has got to bring someone that's unchurched, that doesn't know the Lord. So don't come and tell me you want to be a part of my breakfast team unless you're willing to bring someone. Because if you don't bring someone, I'm not ordering any eggs for you. You're out. Okay, so that's one thing. Another thing that I've been wanting to do, and, I, and I'm praying about this, because uh, my wife's not overly coordinated, so it might have to be a men's thing, because I'm thinking about bowling. And if you've ever seen somebody bowl that may not be gifted in bowling, then you might understand why it might need to be a men's group instead of a couple's group. But I, 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 how many of you like to bowl? Are you any good? I have bowled 300 games. Come on, come on. I'm telling you right now. You know, worship is not just worship, but prayer, right? That's a part of prayer. When he mentions worship as one of the evangelism and, 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 and discipleship and the fellowship, those types of things, evangelism involves world missions. Uh, and so tonight, Pastor Jeff is preaching, and he's going to give out a $100 bill. Now, he gave me this $100 bill. And I'm going to keep it, but he's going to bring another one. <laughs> and he's going to, tonight, he's going to give away a $100 bill. And, uh, and, and, and to, someone's going to get it. It can't be a staff member or their spouse or their children. But it can be anyone else. So I'm sorry, Blake. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. And, uh, but, and Sunday nights are really great. You know, it's really, it's awesome time. It's a different message, a different worship uh, you bring your children that sometimes are in children's church. They learn the corporate worship with adults. It's a beautiful thing. I urge you to come tonight at 6. Uh, and so don't, don't miss it. You might get $100 tonight. And Pastor Jeff asked me to tell you that. So uh, I think he's intending to give this one in my pocket away, though. So, <laughs> so today I, I, I'm doing a message, a part of this uh, Own the Vision series. Tonight, Own the Vision Part 2 with Pastor Jeff. This morning, Own the Vision. The vision is that when we started the church, the vision statement was heaven, heaven. And to keep your eyes on the eternal things, things that money can't buy and death can't take away, things that are eternal, heaven, forever. To, as it says in Colossians, I believe, too, set your affection on things above and not on the things of the earth. As it says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. Heaven is our vision that we're a spiritual people living not for the temporary, but for the eternal, living to serve and give our life with a purpose, not for just temporary things, but for eternal things. And then the, that's the vision, heaven. And the, and, and the mission is to go there and take as many people with us. And I'm, I will tell you that I'm 66 and I'm purposeful right now. I'm purposeful in raising up. Everything that I do, others do. I'm not just walking away, and then I'll do something else because I won't ever lay down the sword. Right? But you used to be, so if you could just see the staff meetings and how much better Pastor Jeff does running the staff. And I, I just stay away from it because it's so much better. Now, if you were... Had, had, had applied for a membership and we didn't get your name in there, that's because I can't administ administrate my, myself out of a wet paper bag. No organization, and it's my fault. I'm over that. So if your name wasn't there, you're still a member, you need to tell me, 
right? So if that happened to you, I'm sorry, it has happened in past years, right? Anybody here that was supposed to be a member, your name didn't get in the bulletin? <laughs> Liar, pants on fire. Anybody else? Nobody? Okay, good. Whew, I did good there. And so, and so, guys, you know, I love people. I do. And I, I'm gift, I, my heart is to be a pastor, to help people, and I really care. I forget things. If I ever forget things, it's not because I didn't mean what I said. I'm not going to say something and not mean it. I do forget things. But you forget things too. Even young people forget things. Hey, boys, quit talking, but I'm going to come down there and kick you right in the nose. Is that you, Smith, boy? Is that, is that one, that's one of your boys, Brian. <laughs> so, he's, he's over there talking about how he can't get that $100 tonight. It, it'll be okay. I'll give you a nickel or something, okay? <laughs> but, but I, I, you know, I'm all about that. And I, you know, just know this. My heart is when I see someone I don't know, I don't know where they're going to heaven, or I see someone that's just hanging on by a thread, or they need to be encouraged, I can look right past you. I mean, literally, I can be right here, and I do not see you. I go, whoop, and I'm looking at the person behind you. And if you're going to have your feelings on your shoulders around me, it's going to get hurt. You know, because I don't always see the people that I know are good, that I love. I know they're okay. But I'll see others right behind you. It's not a good trait. I'm a little ADHD. I'm, I'm a little bit weird, you know. I'm, 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 I don't get hurt easy, so I can hurt easy because I don't, I didn't, why did that hurt you? I can't understand it. You can explain why it hurt you. And I go, really? That hurt you? It wouldn't hurt me. That's just who I am. But guess what? A pastor that doesn't get hurt easy stays around 29 years because y'all have all hurt me really bad. <laughs> And you know, what I, you know what I tell the pastors? I say, you're Jesus to the people. When they hurt you, just put your hands out and say, I love you. They don't know what they do. Forgive them. It's okay. You can never be immature to people that act immature. And even the maturest person acts immature every now and then. So never expect maturity because you're not always going to get it. Even my wife has been immature a time or two. I don't, I don't remember it, but I'm sure... Sure, it's happened. So, on the vision is that we're a people that want to be in this place. When you're here, you're looking out for anyone you don't know because you don't know if they know Jesus because we want to win souls all over the world and here. We want to do our part, our heart, our mission. So, the title of the message, <clears throat> and this is part one of On the Vision, the title of the message is What Did Jesus Say? And I had a 25-hour sermon. <clears throat> I did. I had a 25-hour sermon, didn't I, Austin? You had a 23-point sermon. I was going to preach an hour on each one of them. Maybe it was a 23-hour sermon. It was a long one. And I figured, okay, i got to kind of back off here. Because what I realized is Jesus said a whole lot. But some people are so arrogant that they go, well, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. I don't believe that. Let me tell you something then. Why do you believe anything about Jesus? If you're going to throw away what he says about certain things you don't agree with and you don't like, why would you believe that he died on the cross and his blood paid for your sin and he's got a place for heaven? Why do you believe he would forgive you? Why do you think you're going to go to heaven? Right? Why do you believe anything? And to the world, I say, why would you believe anything about this Jesus if you're going to throw it out? I'm not very, I'm not very good at preaching when... People are amen and me and all that. So be quiet, everybody. <laughs> Shh. You, you other weird pastors might like all that. Yeah, preach that, brother. Now, I, I do it myself because I like to do it, but sparingly. I mainly do it to throw Hawkins off because he, his sermons are perfect. I never heard a more perfect sermon by that guy. But he's the best sermons whew, they're good now you but you don't have him today this is 29 anniversary sunday so you got me that's the way it is so the first thing i want you to see jesus said is this and you might want to take pictures of the screen point one love sinners that's what jesus said love sinners where did it say that 
in Luke 5. This will be a different version that I'm reading that is on the screen, but I think the two of them go together. So you can read the screen or listen up. Then Levi gave him a great feast, starting in verse 29. Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors. Are there any tax collectors in here? Anybody work for the IRS in here? I might need a favor someday if I do. Okay. <laughs> tax collectors, in quote, sinners, sinners, they were sinners. They were known to be sinners. They cheated the people and others who sat down with them. And the scribes and Pharisees, those religious leaders, they complained against the disciples saying, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them and said, he answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus loved sinners. He ate with sinners. He was in uh, interest groups with sinners. He fished with sinners. He went and had meals with sinners. He hung out with sinners. He gave them his love and he gave them his truth. And while there are things that are clearly sin, you don't necessarily live in that sin or agree with that sin, but you need to love people where they are because if you don't, they'll never come to Jesus because truth doesn't enter a man's heart unless there's love given out of a man's heart. If you don't have love, which is the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit doesn't quicken the truth and it won't pierce the heart and won't change anybody. And as a church, as I say, I'm calling you forward to love sinners, to be a people that will be friends with and eat with and invite people over that are pure sinners and you know it. Doesn't mean they're all bad. They just don't know any better. That's number one, love sinners. That's what Jesus said. He said also, I value sinners repeating, uh, repenting more than the greatest treasure. In Luke 15, we read starting in verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found the coin which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what would you get more excited about? A hundred thousand dollar bonus? or the fact that you sat down and loved and purposed and planned and schemed and worked a friendship and were able to share Jesus and the person gave his heart to the Lord. Which one are you more excited about, the money or the sinners repenting? Jesus said, I'm excited about sinners because he said, I have come to seek and save the lost. Do you hear the word seek? He was seeking. It wasn't like, oh, I'll just tell you, maybe you can come. No, he's looking for, he's seeking, he's reaching to, he's loving, he's caring, he's speaking to, he's seeking out to save the lost. Do we have that in our hearts? Pastor Weeks would always tell me, you can tell a person's heart by their, ta by their talent, treasure, and time. Look at their calendar. What do they spend their time on? Look at their checkbook. What do they spend their treasure on? And are they sitting on their talent or using their talent everywhere else? Or are they using it for the kingdom of God? My mentor knew a thing or two, didn't he? He comes to the early service, by the way, with his whole family. He told me this week he was really proud of me. And then the next thing Jesus said is he wants you to use your money for his kingdom. Use your money for his kingdom. In Luke chapter 12, 32, he says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms, providing yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in heavens that do not fail, where no thief approaches or moths destroys, for your treasure is your heart will be also. In Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said you can't serve God and money. You'll love the one, hate the other. You can't serve both. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? <clears throat> Use your money for his kingdom. Jesus, another place said, <clears throat> he said, the heathen know how to use their money to influence for the good. Why doesn't my church know how to use money that way? And yet, I've had people criticize me because we use money to give a gift card. By the way, this $100 bill is Jeff's $100 bill. It's Jeff's. Jeff Hill. It's not the church's. It's his. But if it gets someone to Christ because we have a promotion and we say, look, when, when, I, when, I, gave, when I gave the, uh, the trip to Orlando a couple of years ago, that was our 
time condo that we gave, right? We paid for those tickets. But if it had come out of the church, so what? If we learn to use our money, why? So that a soul gets saved. Is that not worth something? Sure is. Then Luke 12, 13, then one of the crowd spoke to Jesus saying, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. Paul told that also to Timothy. Store up your treasure in heaven. That's what Jesus said. The next thing he said is fire up. Fire up. We're asleep at the wheel. We need to wake up and fire up because when you fire it up, it makes a difference, right? If we're lackadaisical, what the greatest insult is to know that God gave his son, Jesus suffered, he was punished, he was, he was like they, 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 uh, they cruelly treated him and he had great pain and he died for our sins and took our place and we go, yeah, thank you, that's good and we go live our life and it doesn't matter, we're not even thankful. Like the story Jesus tells about the lepers and only one returned to say thank you, the other nine didn't, right? He also taught you all to be thankful. You ought to remember, be thankful. He said, fire up. In Revelation 3, it talks about the Laodiceans, the church in Laodicea. The angel of the church said to this church, Laodicea says in Revelation 3, starting in verse 14, these things say the, the amen, the faithful true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither cold or hot. I, 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 I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And he goes on, he says, jumping on down to 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. I believe maybe it's verse 19, be zealous and repent. Listen, what are we doing? We're, we, we are more interested in spending money and planning and being fired up about football. Just get one of those people that are making 30 million a year throwing a football or hitting a baseball or pitching somebody and get them saved. Then we'll have that six million easy if they just learn to tithe. Right? Come on. I, I believe six million can come in because some of you are going to win some big millionaires. Besides that, some of you are probably sitting on a nest somewhere, money hidden it under your bed somewhere. Jesus is going to get that rusty stuff out of there, lay up treasure in heaven. I don't know for sure. But I know one thing. We plan more. We, 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 we plan more. We scheme more. We do more details to plan our next vacation than we do to find someone to get them to Jesus. And we spend more money on them too than we do for Jesus. Just saying. Next one, Jesus said world missions is important. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe that all I commanded you. Let me tell you something. That's where I'm, I'm going to say that's for us here, but it's also, it's talking about all nations. So we're talking missions, praying for, giving to, sending, getting this gospel all over the world. I believe that's what the heart of God is. I really do. And world missions is important. It really is. It matters around the world. It changes our culture. Our country's in trouble. We need evangelism. We need to win the lost. Jesus not only said world missions is important, but he also said give sacrificially. The next thing, in Mark 12, it says, and Jesus sat across from the treasury and observed the people throwing their money into the treasury. And many who were rich cast in much. And there approached a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which makes a farthing. And he called his disciples to himself and said to them, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in much more than everyone who has given to the treasury. For they cast in out of, look at this, out of their abundance, they gave out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Obedience is more important than sacrifice, but I want to tell you something. Too often, we, we, we pay, we, we, to the penny, we figure our tithe, and we give it to God, and then there's nothing else we're going to give, and then we go, good job. Guess what the Pharisees, the Bible says, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, they paid their tithe to a, to a point, to a mint, to a T. They did everything to the letter of the law. But he said there was something wrong with their heart. And I'm telling you, you can, I believe in the tithe, but if you give it out of the law, out of the letter of the law, and not out of the heart of sacrifice and giving, and giving to missions, and giving and helping the poor, and giving and giving and giving. And people say, well, all you do is talk about giving money. I said, no, that's not what we do. We really don't. 
We occasionally do, but I'm going to tell you something. It shows what your heart is. And who said it? I did. Jesus talked about giving more than this place. He talked about giving, yet people don't want you to bring up giving. Why? Because, let me tell you something. It has to do with your heart. You, you, you know, that's fine. I'll do this and this, but don't ask me for the money. What about the rich guy? Jesus goes, uh, uh, he says, well, what else do I got to do to inherit? He, he, was it, he wasn't going to go to heaven. He just knew it. What do I do to inherit the kingdom of God? The guy said, oh, I'll tell you what. Go, go, get, go sell, sell everything you have and give all your money to the poor. And he went away sad. Jesus said, no, wait, come back. It's okay. Just give 10%. No, he didn't. He let him go because he knew money was his God. It's not about that God wanted or needed all of his money. It's because he saw his heart. His heart was owned by money. You can't serve God in money. So give sacrificially. Ask God, what do you have you give? And the next thing I want you to see, and I'm about done, is hell is real. Hell is real. In Matthew 8, 12, Jesus said this. He said that there'll be darkness and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell. He talked about it a lot. In Matthew 5, 22, it says it's a place of fire. In uh, Matthew 10, 28, it says hell, hell is a place of torment. Uh, and no, Luke 16, 23 says it's a place of torment. Matthew 10, 28, it says you need to fear God who can destroy body, both body and soul in hell. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said hell is an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He never prepared hell for people. People go, I can't serve a God that would throw somebody in hell. Well, guess what? That's not his heart. The Bible says it's not his will that any perish. That people are already condemned, that he gave his son so they wouldn't be condemned. He doesn't want them to go to hell. He gave Jesus. He made a way. People choose by rejecting Jesus not to find the answer in the path to eternal life, to heaven. They, we, mankind messed it up. That's where we're destined. We, that's why we have to be saved from the penalty of our sin and the ultimate destruction of our body and soul. Jesus, Jesus talked about hell because, and if we want to win the loss, we're going, we really believe hell is real because Jesus said it. And you can say, well, I don't believe hell is real. I don't believe it's eternal. I don't believe it's like that. Why would it go? Listen, I don't care what you believe. If you're going to throw out what Jesus said here, then throw everything out. Don't pick and choose the sugar sticks like a lot of churches. It's true. Don't do it. I, I didn't say it. I don't like preaching about it, but it's real. I'm warning you. If your kid was getting in the street and there was semis on it all the time, you'd say, get out of the street. You'd warn them to save their life. Jesus said there's hell and it's real. And we need to warn people that Jesus is the one that saves and changes hearts. And then he says, he says because hell is real, he also said, help me spread the good news. In Matthew 9, 35 to 38, Jesus went around to the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among them. But when he saw the multitudes, look at this, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like a sheep without a shepherd. And then he spoke to his disciples saying this, the harvest truly is plentiful. In other words, there's a lot of people that need to be saved. They need Jesus. They need repentance. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. We need to be willing to go into that harvest field to win the lost. Are you willing to give your life? So here's the practical application. You see those cards? You can fill them out. Because I believe this is the most relatable, current, palatable in our culture way to win the lost. is to develop groups of interest and make friends of people who need Jesus. Love them first and give them the truth. Bring them into your circle. Reach out to them from your neighborhood. Reach out from the work, wherever you can find them. There's no age that can't do it. I mean, if you can barely move, you can get a wheelchair group, whatever you want to do. You know, you can, play, you can play dominoes. You can do whatever. There's no excuse. Have people over. You can do it. And you can bring people that need Christ. You just pray God will give you the people that you can invite that are unchurched and need Jesus. Or maybe they're churched, and that message is not going to send them to heaven because it's not God's message. Hmm. So that's a practical application to bring those cards right up here. And if you don't know for sure, then you can give them later. The second thing is, is I'm asking the whole church to say, there's power in being together. That we would stand to our feet, that we would all come here, and we would lift ourselves to God and say, I stand surrendered to the purposes and the call of God. So that souls and human beings would find what God had provided through his son that sacrificed his life in, in pain that we might live forever, that you would commit yourself. But you know, commitment is no longer good in 2019 America. 
because the average believer comes to church about two out of four times a month. It's across the statistics, if that. Also, can I just say one thing I meant to say back here? When, it talk, when I talked about the Great Commission to go and preach the gospel, and it says to teach them, Matthew 28, 19, 20, teach them to observe all things. Grandparents, parents, listen to me. It is not the church's job to get your kids saved. It's your job. It's your job. It's not the church's job to educate your children in, with the Bible. It's your job. Disciple them. Teach them. Grandparents, instead of just eating pie with your grandkids, you figure out something to do that you're teaching your grandkids. Pass on the gospel. Train them. And if you're depending totally on a Christian school so your kids will grow up, guess what? They won't grow up. They will not grow up if you're not doing it yourselves. You cannot send them to Christian school to teach them the Bible and send them to Sunday school to teach them the Bible or send them wherever to teach them the Bible to youth group. They won't make it. The world is evil and the world is secular and it will suck them down. You're the number one influence. Parents, sit down. Teach your kids the Bible. Get a plan. That's the first line of evangelism. Your children, your grandchildren, and the part of the evangelistic call to the world, the whole world here, is to not only preach it and baptize them, but teach them to observe all things I command you. So if you're willing to get on board with the mission and say together we can do great things, because guess what? I mean, literally, I'm telling you, if we will a activate this plan and that we will, we will really give ourselves to this and every person will do it, we could win 10,000 people this next year to Jesus. 10,000. I'm telling you, we can. Uh, do you believe that? I believe that with all of my heart. There's so many people that need something real, and it's love with truth. It's not just love like a lot of churches have with no truth, with the spin truth, with the sugar stick truth. It's the whole truth and nothing but the truth with love. By the power of the Spirit, quickened and anointed, it will change the hearts of people. And you've got it in you. We've got to get it out to the world. Will you stand with me? Would you get to this altar and bring these cards as the Holy Spirit, the, the worship team is going to, we're going to sing a song of commitment. The worship team is going to bring these, uh, bring the song and we're going to bring these cards if you have them and fill them out, take a minute. But I want you also, the whole church, and don't block the aisles, all the way to the front, we're going to come here and we're going to lift ourselves and present ourselves to God as a sacrifice to the Lord. Would you do it as, as we come right now? Would you come? Even before the music starts, just come on, bring the cards, and come and present yourself to God. If you come, don't just drop your card. I don't want just a card commitment. I want a body. I want a soul. I want every all commitment. I think the whole place should come here as close as we can because the front here of these benches are from what we know as the altar where they would offer animals, sacrifice, to die. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. It means die to yourself. Take up your cross, die to yourself. Come closer so people can get in behind you. Come up. And this altar represents, so when you come forward, you're saying, I'm laying my life down. It's not my will, but your will be done. I live for your purposes. You came to seek and save the lost. I'm going to seek and save the lost, and I'm giving my life as a purpose, purposeful to do the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we just commit ourselves to what you just said, that we would, we would look fully upon you in the fire of your spirit, and that you would burn in our hearts, God, that we'd not look back and we believe you to do your purpose. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's someone not sure you go to heaven. Close your eyes, plead to respect your neighbor. You're not sure you're ready, and if you were to die tonight, you would not wake up in heaven, but you want Jesus to take away your sins and change your heart. If you're here, would you lift your hand? Anyone here? Say, I need Jesus to change my heart and forgive my sin. I want to make sure I'm ready for heaven. Anyone here? Lift your hand quickly. Everybody's eyes are down. Thank you for respecting your neighbors. All right. I don't see anybody if I missed anybody, but... Jesus, I pray that all of us would truly be 100% surrendered to your purpose. You sent us out. You sent your disciples out two by two. You sent us out, and I send this church unified in one purpose. Keep our eyes on eternal things in heaven and work for that purpose to bring your salvation, Jesus, and to point everybody to you, Jesus, because you're the way, truth, and the life. So may we go and do your work and get refocused on the eternal things. In Christ's name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen, amen, amen. Woo!